Hello, Chameleon Wranglers. This is Bill Strand, and I want to introduce you to Blue. Blue is a yellow-lipped Parsons chameleon, and I just got back from Madagascar where I got to see Blue's wild cousins crawling around the trees, and it was an incredible experience. And I plan on sharing a number of the things that I learned while seeing chameleons in their natural habitat. You have joined me and Blue for the Chameleon Hour, where we're going to uh, have a number of segments about chameleons and an interview at the end. Basically, we're just going to have an hour for chameleon lovers to hang out and enjoy the art of chameleon herpetoculture. Now, the first segment that I'd like to introduce you to is a very special event that happened in Madagascar. Uh, I came across a female panther chameleon who was actually digging a, uh, a hole to lay eggs. And of course, I want to share this experience with you and what I learned. And so I made a clip that I filmed in Madagascar to share with you here. Should we roll it, Blue? We're going to roll it. Hello, Chameleon Academy. This is Bill Strand, and I am in Madagascar. I want to share an experience that we had uh, here. Uh, we were going to look for some uh, Nepenthes madagascarensis, which is a Madagascar pitcher plant. But as we were walking uh, on the path, we saw a female Fursifer pardalis panther chameleon digging a hole uh, to lay her eggs. And this has got me very excited because uh, seeing how deep they dig their hole in what substrate they dig their hole in the wild is exciting to me. And that is data that uh, can definitely help us with captive husbandry. Now, while she was digging her hole, it was relatively easy to sit and film her because when chameleons have their head down in the ground, they don't necessarily see you. So as long as we st uh, uh, were standing back, we would be able to uh, take photographs of her, video of her, and we wouldn't disturb her. Now, the one point where we will disturb her is when she turns around and is ready to deposit her eggs and her head comes out of the hole. Well. She went ahead and got to this point while we were filming, and so uh, she got disturbed and actually left the, uh, the, the laying hole. And so we felt very bad about that, but we left immediately on the off chance that she would come back to the hole. But <laughs> there was two positive unintended consequences of this. First of all, I was able to measure how deep the hole was that she had dug. Measuring the depth with a stick and then the stick with my glasses and then my glasses with a ruler when we got back to the hotel, it showed that the hole was three inches deep. And if you fill that hole with an inch of eggs, then that tells us that the babies are expected to dig out of two inches of soil. A couple of hours later, I came back to the site to check on her progress. Sure enough, she had come back to the hole, laid her eggs, and was covering up the hole when I got there. And so the other piece of information that we have is in the wild, yes, if they are disturbed while they are doing their egg laying, they will come back to the hole. And come the next wet season, we're gonna have 20 to 30 babies coming out of that path. Now let's go ahead and think a little bit about what we observed. Earlier in the day, I observed a, uh, a a hatching. Now, I couldn't find exactly where the hatching was, but I, I found a bunch of babies scattered around uh, the ferns, and they had the white sand stuck to them. And so, obviously, they had just uh, just hatched, just crawled out of their, dug out of their hole. Looking around, I couldn't find the exact hatching site, but this was uh, in the forest. It was in amongst the, the, the ferns and the trees. And the soil was, there's a lot of uh, leaves on top of it. There was a layer of detritus, those are the decaying leaves. It was a uh, very light, sandy soil, easy to dig through. Um, that makes sense, but it was nothing like the spot that this female chose, which was in the path. It was hard packed. I, I tried to dig a hole in it and I found it was packed solid. And so it was an interesting choice that she made there in the path, packed solid and vulnerable. There was no cover and uh, she, she actually almost got stepped on. So that is an interesting choice and something that we need to consider as to uh, why do they make these choices? Do they just pick a spot? Uh, is it because panther chameleons aren't that picky? I mean, in captivity, they're really not that picky. 
Uh, or was there something about that spot that was special to her? Now, even though the soil was firmly packed, uh, it, it's still sandy, and so it still will, uh, will drain, but it's difficult to, uh, to dig through, both for her and the babies. And so this is just another example of how uh, all of this information that we gather from observing chameleons in the wild goes to our collective knowledge as we try to figure out these incredible creatures. So this has been a wonderful day, uh, and I am so glad uh, I was able to see both a hatching and an egg laying. This is Bill Strand signing off. See you later. All right, welcome back. And I, and I gotta say, that was such a special uh, experience and, and something we didn't expect. I mean, you can expect to see panther chameleons, but you can never just say, okay, we're gonna find one that's laying eggs. And so that was totally unexpected, but I'm so glad that, uh, I, that I had that experience because I was able to uh, observe the natural behaviors as to what was going on. You going somewhere, Blue? He does not seem to be very content to sit on a branch like he usually is. He usually, he's usually a pretty calm Parsons chameleon, but not today. Uh, and we're gonna go ahead and introduce the, uh, the second segment here. And then uh, Blue, I'll go ahead and put you back in your cage. So uh, for the second segment here, I wanted to talk about working with certain species of chameleons. I get this question a lot of asking which species should I work with? And so uh, I went ahead and, uh, and made a clip of me discussing some of the things to think about when you uh, want to consider which species of chameleon to work with. So let's go ahead and roll this while I take Blue back to his cage. Hello, this is Bill Strand, and it is a nice, cloudy, rainy day. And what do we do on nice, cloudy, rainy days? We talk chameleons. That's what we do. Today, we're going to be talking about the question, what species should I get involved with? And this is uh, usually asked by people who are thinking, hmm, should I just pick a chameleon that I just like? Or is there an opportunity to do more for the community with my choice? And uh, th that, those are great thoughts. So when someone's asking, what chameleon species they should start off with. Uh, first of all, the uh, question is how much experience do you have with chameleons? Uh, are you in a position where you really want to do something that would be helpful for the community? Uh, if you are just starting off with chameleons, my suggestion would be to pick one that you love. And, uh, I, and I will say that as long as the information is available for that species, and you are willing to do what it takes to set up for that species, uh, most chameleon species are about the same uh, difficulty level. And so if you're set up for a chameleon, you can pretty much handle whatever species you can get your hands on. Uh, the advantage of some of the more common species, like the panther chameleon, is that there's all sorts of information, there's all sorts of experience, and so there are people there that can help you with any questions. And so, if you are a beginner, and you're wondering what chameleon to start off with, I generally say the panther chameleon. And that is because they're hardy, they're enjoyable, and there's a deep well of information available uh, with uh, breeders all over and YouTubers, and there's just so much information about panther chameleons that you will get the support you need. Now, there is a, uh, a follow-up, a runner-up, shall we say, uh, coming up soon, and that is the carpet chameleon. Uh, the carpet chameleon has a number of dedicated breeders that are soon going to be making a number of captive hatched individuals available, and this is amazing. Carpet chameleons are a great species to keep. They're colorful, they're cryptic, they have great patterns, and they're smaller. They can be kept like panther chameleons, so it isn't like they have uh, strange uh, husbandry conditions that you have to uh, adhere to. So can be ca uh, taken care of like a panther, but can be kept in a smaller cage. And so that helps out a number of people who are just starting off. So if you are just starting off, panther chameleon or carpet chameleon is a great 
choice. Now this question is also asked by people who are experienced in the community and they're experienced with chameleons and they're wondering what chameleon would be a good uh, next chameleon or a serious project. They're ready to start breeding and they're saying uh, which one would be a, a good one to get into that would do uh, good things for the community. And when we're uh, going in at that level, I am going to say to stay away from panther chameleons or veiled chameleons, not because you have to stay away from them, but because there uh, so much effort has been done with those already. If you want to do something, perhaps get into breeding or do something that uh, is going to help the community, I'm going to go back to that carpet chameleon because that community is just starting and is starting to explode. And right now we have a chance. The carpet chameleon is the best chance that we have in the chameleon community of establishing another species in captivity. Uh, if all imports stopped right now, we would be essentially left with veiled chameleons in uh, panther chameleons. It's kind of scary to think about that, but with all the chameleons available, uh, so many of them, most of them, almost all of them are dependent upon uh, imports. So it is a substantial accomplishment for us to establish another species in captivity and we have that chance with the carpet chameleon. But there's only uh, two major breeders of carpet chameleons. We need at least 10. So if uh, you want to start uh, with a serious project, carpet chameleons are a great species to look into. Uh, and, and go ahead and start with a pair. You don't have to start with 10 pairs right away to make a difference. Start off with a pair, get used to it. You can breed them and, uh, you know, eight to 12 eggs. Perfect uh, manageable way to start uh, uh, learning how to take care of chameleon babies. So in summary, if you're asking which chameleon you should start off with or get involved with, uh, it's going to be uh, either the panther chameleon, especially if you're just starting off, or the carpet chameleon if you've got some experience under your belt and you'd like to uh, take on a project that would be useful for the community. Now, get me talking any longer and I could come up with all sorts of reasons and other species uh, and we could uh, just spend the day talking about how wonderful chameleons are and what wonderful chameleon projects we could all get involved with. So I am uh, trying to rein myself in and keep it down to just one species for beginners and just one species for people who are experienced and looking to get into their next project. And so panther chameleon, carpet chameleon, those are my picks. See you next time. All right, so Blue is back in his cage. Now, the reason why I wanted to do that segment is uh, we often answer the question as to which is the best chameleon for beginners. And uh, often that, that is the panther chameleon or the veiled chameleon. And of course we have our various reasons for that. I like the panther chameleon because there's a lot of community support for panther chameleons. Uh, but the question that we don't often answer is what about for your second chameleon or when you want to do more within the community and that's why I wanted to do that segment because uh, what do you do once you have a chameleon experience and uh, once you have some chameleon experience you really have the uh, the freedom to choose just about any species you want because they're really not that different. Of course, there are some outliers like Triosaurus cristatus, and, and there's definitely some outliers, but once you're experienced with chameleons, uh, you're going to know where to go to get the information to find out about them. So I hope that was a good discussion for you. Yes, I believe that the carpet chameleons are the, the species that's up and coming and that we can really do uh, something good for the community by getting more people involved and experienced with carpet chameleons. I think that's something that can be an upward spiral for us. Hello, we're now here on location inside of a cage. And today I would like to talk about a little bit of a hint and a tip for creating chameleon cages. The hint and tip is simply to use the double pot method. And this is something I've been talking about for years and years, but you know what? It works so well that I want to bring it up again. And simply put, that's where you use two pots that are the same size. One of the pots you mount inside the cage and the other pot you put the plant in. And that way 
you can move the pot in and out of the mounted pot and you don't have to mess with all of your mounting hardware. This is an easy way for you to be able to put in new plants, uh, take out old plants to get them watered or more sunlight, whatever they need. It is very simple to do. The way I do it is I use zip ties. I, I drill holes in the pot and then I zip tie it to the branches or any mounting structure. And then my second pot just easily slips right in and slips right out. So I can take care of plants and I can give my cage an entire new look if I need to. And this is a simple way to make your chameleon caging easy to put together and modify in the future. I call it the double pot method and please use it to make your life easier. And speaking of plants, now it's time for our main interview, and that's with Elizabeth Vasquez of Propagated Perfection. Propagated Perfection is a business that deals with house plants. And of course, we love house plants. And the one problem that affects many people putting their chameleon cage together for the first time is we need at least one big plant that's a big and bushy so the chameleon can drink off of the leaves and can hide behind them and, and feel secure. This is important for chameleon husbandry. And when you go to Home Depot, often there aren't any large pothos or other plants there that you can use as the, uh, what I call the hero plant. And so you're left with a sparse cage that your chameleon's not feeling secure in. Well, I found Elizabeth and she is able to find all sorts of plants, all sorts of sizes. And so I wanted to bring her on, introduce her to the community. And as we'll see in the interview, she may be the answer if you need that one hero plant quickly. So please join me in welcoming Elizabeth to the Chameleon Academy podcast. Hello Community Academy, this is Bill Strand and today we're going to be talking about plants and I am excited to bring you someone who knows more about plants than I do, Elizabeth Vasquez from Propagated Perfection and Elizabeth, it is so good to see you again. Yeah, Hello, you everybody. too, I'm so glad to be here. <laughs> yeah, hi everyone. I uh, met Elizabeth at a, a street fair. Yeah, uh, the Patchwork Festival Street Fair, mm -hmm. where she had her uh, her booth set up, and with the most gorgeous plants inside Thank of there. You. And by the way, my angel wing begonia is still doing great. Yay! I have one and, right next uh, to me too. And, How funny if I can get it in there? <laughs> oh, very good. That's awesome. <laughs> All right, Elizabeth, before we jump into all about plants, uh, let's go ahead and give an introduction to who you are and what is Propagated Perfection. Sure. So like you said, my name is Elizabeth. Um, I've had my plant business for about two and a half years now. Um, Propagated Perfection was honestly a fun name that my best friend came up with because I am not, I am not creative in that way. <laughs> so I love the alliteration. Um, and a lot of my plants are propagations, which are basically small cuttings that you take from other bigger plants, let them grow some roots, and then you can pot them. So it's like you can get 100 plants out of one big plant. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's that's my business. It's just me right now. Um, my sister helps me every once in a while. But yeah, I ship all over the US. And I just really enjoy helping people learn to love plants and learn how to love them and take care of them because that's always the hard part is being able to take care of them. <laughs> People yeah, get a little yeah. overwhelmed, but it's a lot easier than you think. So, so you both propagate plants, uh, but you also sell full size plants. I've yes. noticed. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So how is that? What's that balance there? Um, it kind of just depends on the plant. Um, if it's something that's going to grow a lot slower, I have growers that I partner with and I like know personally that will help me be able to pick out the best plants um, and make sure that, you know, they come in looking good. Um, smaller things like anything that's easy to, to, you know, like a pothos, so easy to propagate. They propagate quickly. You get roots on them really quickly. Like here, this is a philodendron. I think I've had this in a, in one of my propagation vessels for like, maybe two weeks and it's gotten like all these roots. So if that kind of shows you what, what to do with like anything like that's going to grow a little bit slower, like I started to propagate the angel wing begonia and let it grow quickly, like you said. So yeah, I have a mix between getting stuff for my growers who obviously have their big nurseries and then my place at home where I have my, my backyard greenhouse and I 
get my stuff growing. Right now I had to move all my plants inside because it was windy, but makes a makes a fun plant room. So Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, something that's on the mind of every chame- uh, person who's putting together a chameleon cage is when we first put together a cage, we need at least one big full pothos or mm-hmm. something. Usually it's pothos because they get big and uh, for for hiding for the chameleon so they mm-hmm. feel safe. But of course, when we are just putting together the cage to begin with, it's really hard to snap our fingers and have a full blown pothos appear totally. at Home Depot or something. Is this something that we can tell you, come to you and say, Elizabeth, I really need a big full pothos. Would you be able to find something like that and ship it to anywhere in the United States? Oh yeah, definitely. I can ship, ship, I can get that for you, get it pretty much. Yeah. Anywhere in the United States and, um, whatever U S territories as well. I've shipped some stuff to, um, Puerto Rico. So if you're out there, (laughs) we can do that too. But yeah, I, I can definitely do that, especially with, um, with plants like that. I, I have one specific guy that I partner with that like his, his specialty is in getting pothos massive. So I, I am definitely able okay. to help with that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and how about Canada? Canada? Are I'm not there yet. Over the border? I wish I, I could, but it's, there's such a large fee to be honest with you, because there's technically an import fee that, that people in the other yeah. country then have to pay. And it's almost like then they're paying an extra hundred dollars for a plant. I mean, it depends. If you get enough, it kind of kind of balances out. But um, it's definitely something I'd be interested in looking into um, if there was okay. if there was a need. And, and for the listeners, I kind of knew the answer to the question as to whether she could uh, find these big full plants <laughs> and uh, ship to us chameleon people because uh, <laughs> that's one of the things that got me very excited about bringing her on here is because that is a service that we really need it so uh, Mm -hmm. we're going to explore that elizabeth here's the thing say we find those a beautiful looking plant you send us a beautiful looking plant three months later it's not necessarily looking as beautiful as when we saw it sitting there in a store or got it in the mail what is going on there and and i know it's a big question but (laughs) how can we take care of these plants so they uh not only can uh, look as good but grow and and look better yeah great question um i can go over like the the three things that i would say to really be on the lookout for um a lot of the times depending on the plant um it really depends on the type of lighting that it's getting um if it's getting too little or too much water and the humidity um so we'll use pothos for example because like you said that's what you guys like to use a lot which is great because they're perfect for that Um, so with pothos, a good rule of thumb is you can tell if it's not getting enough light by, um, the way the, the leaf, if there's a certain leaf that's starting to yellow, you're going to want to see if the yellowing is coming from like the inside of the leaf, like here, I can kind of show with one of these guys, with one of these propagations. Um, this is a philodendron, which is similar to a pothos. So if you have yellowing coming from inside starting here back where the stem is and going down normally this here means it's getting too much water um and something needs to get cut back you might just need to trim off those leaves and kind of let it um, let it revive itself because the one thing is once you start having those leaves yellowing a common misconception is that you can get them to go back green that's not the case you just should cut it off because um it's it's basically hard and it's already, it's already on its way to dying and Um, people don't always realize that and they're like, oh, it'll be fine. But if anything, it helps the plant be able to cut off whatever that, that issue is and help the rest of it. So that's the, that's the one thing when it comes to watering with, with that, if it's getting underwatered or doesn't have enough humidity, you're going to have a lot of yellowing around the outside of the leaves. You might have some browning as well. Um, and the texture of the leaf will be more crispy, whereas inside if it's getting overwatered it's almost going to be a squishy texture um so that's the best best thing when it comes to watering um humidity for most of those plants anything that's like a pothos philodendron um really those big bushy plants that you can think of syngoniums like this one behind me is an albo syngonium um these are great too they get they get pretty massive um 
So those are, those are great with humidity. Um, obviously I don't think you guys throw succulents in there, but anything that's really like a succulent isn't going to do as well if you have like 50 to hundred percent humidity because they get squishy. They don't have a way of flicking off the water like the rest of the plants do. They just soak it all in and then get brown and mushy and gross. Um, okay. And then lighting wise, I think you guys have a good amount of, I would say, lighting and stuff in your cages, but you also want to make sure it's still getting that natural indirect sunlight. Um, so sometimes that helps. You sometimes might need to like take the plant out of the cage, maybe let it get some, some sun for a day and then move it back in. That sometimes might help. So yeah, it's, it can be a lot, okay. but those are the three main things I would say would be check your watering, check your sunlight and check your humidity. If we're going to Home Depot or any uh -huh. other nursery, how, what do we look for to know that this is going to be a healthy plant? And you already started mm -hmm. uh, talking about some of that, but let's yeah. go ahead and make a checklist. I go, sure. how do I know if this plant is healthy besides, well, it looks green. What, what kind of things mm -hmm. should I look for as a checklist? I would say main thing, check for bugs. Um, okay. sometimes you kind of have to do a gross method where you wipe your hand under the underside of the leaf. And if you have some like brown, <laughs> some brown like marks on your hand, there's, there's probably bugs unless it's dirt, but just be mindful of that. Because like I said, that puts in so much extra work that you don't need to be dealing with. Um, <clears throat> and then the second thing would be, well, um, let's, to, uh, I want to oh, ask sure. about those bugs. Uh, yeah. so our the greenhouses, are they using pesticides? It depends. I know some that try to use more of the like organic, like, like I was saying for me, I'll use stuff that's like neem oil or I don't really treat my plants unless I know there are bugs on them. Um, so, and, the, and if that's the case, I will try to, you know, quarantine it um, on its own, make that work. So I know other nursery's do that as well, but they do use certain like contact pesticides that they'll spray all over or um, kind of just put them all over every plant in their greenhouse just to, as a preventative. Um, so they do, they do use those. Um, so that would probably be another thing that I would say is be mindful of that when you get your plants. What I try to do is wipe off or even rinse with water, um, rinse off all of that stuff. Cause you can kind of see a white residue a lot of the time when you, when you know okay. they've sprayed. Um, it almost looks chalky is the best way to explain it. Um, try to wipe that off, especially with, you know, having chameleons, you don't want them licking that and taking in pesticides. That's not good for anybody. Um, yeah. so yeah. just, no. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so just wiping them off, kind of cleaning them off as much as possible. Um, there are other ways, like if your plants do end up getting bugs, you can mix stuff that shouldn't be bad for your chameleon, literally some lukewarm um, water, a few drops of dish soap, and some hydrogen peroxide. You can wipe the leaves off with that. You can pour it in the soil if you if you need to. Um, yeah, there's there's plenty of different methods that aren't as invasive to both the plant and to the chameleon. Yeah, so number two um, would definitely be to check the soil. Um, again, like I said, the plant can look great, but once you check the soil, sometimes you'll see uh, like if it's really wet, a lot, a lot of the times you'll see like a layer of mold on the top of the plant, especially if the plant hasn't been cared for properly. They're, they kind of have a habit of going through and just spraying all of the plants, giving them the same amount of water, like the same amount of, of everything when that that's plants are all different. They need different care. Um, so checking that top layer of soil and making sure there isn't like a white, like, like kind of like the pesticides that there isn't like a white chalky slash powdery texture on top um or even like a basically it's mold so if you're seeing that I would be mindful of that you can you can fix the plant up kind of do what you can by scraping that top layer off but you're going to put more work in by trying to then go home you'll probably want to repot the plant with some new soil wipe it off as much as you can just because that that does sometimes seep all the way down into the soil, can get into the roots, none of that fun stuff. So checking the soil for mold, making sure it's not sopping wet when you get it. Um, Cause most of the times it's been sitting there for a while and it's cold and that's why the soil isn't drying out. 
um, which then hurts the roots. They get mushy, the plant will die, and you can't really even see until it starts to die because the roots are in the pot and you're not looking at them all the time. So I would say that. And then um, also looking for any sort of like diseases the plant has. So if the leaves are looking funky, not just your typical like the whole leaves turning yellow, making room for new growth or underwatered or overwatered. If you start seeing little brown spots on the leaves that are looking like they're almost like polka dots, like all over the, the tip of the leaf or all over one one portion of the leaf, it most likely has some sort of disease. Um, check check the other leaves on the plant. If it's just one leaf, normally that could just that could just be normal cosmetic damage um, from them spraying it with water or trying to hook it up and it's getting bumped by something else. But um, double checking that those spots are um, are actually just cosmetic da damage rather than okay. you know a disease is, is really important too because there's only so much you can do if a plant is already having a full full blown disease. It's gonna be it's gonna be a, a bit of a struggle from there. <laughs> now in my when I go to my uh, regular garden centers, the most the thing I see the most often is uh, very dry soil, as if it hasn't been watered for a gotcha. while. Yeah. How how bad is that, and how, what are the chances of bringing a plant back from being not watered enough? From my experience and from what I've seen, it's a lot easier to bring a plant back that's been underwatered than overwatered. Um, because you can still kind of revive the roots for lack of a better way to explain that. Um, if it's, if it's super dry to the point where almost all the leaves are really getting crispy and, um, have that gross, like it's going to break if you touch it texture. Um, I, I would just avoid that plant if possible. Um, you can still bring it back. I do recommend watering it specific ways before putting it into your chameleon cage because you don't want to put a plant in there that's already going to be dried out super quickly. The good thing is your cage is perfect for that plant because it needs a lot of humidity, <laughs> needs a lot of water, okay. needs all that stuff. But um, you definitely still can bring it back. I would say if you really had to pick between getting an overwatered pothos and an underwatered pothos, I would get the underwatered pothos because you, there's more of a chance of helping it and it's a lot easier to help yep. it than it would be to help this overwatered plant where the roots might already be dead. Uh, and then our good old roots, which are a little bit more difficult because they're inside the pot, but sometimes mm -hmm. we can see at the, we go and go ahead and see at the bottom, we can yep. see get a little bit of an idea of what's going on mm -hmm. there. Uh, what are the dangers of these plants being root bound and how mm -hmm. bad of a situation is a root bound plant? Again, we'll use pothos for, uh, for an example. The good thing is it's they're a very, very great hardy. example. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> very hardy, very sturdy. So you can kind of leave it in a pot for, for longer than most people would recommend. Um, for most plants, I would say you're gonna want to repot like every six six months to every 10 months which can be kind of over overwhelming for people but the best way to check is just you know looking like you were saying at the bottom of the pot if you're seeing a bunch of roots starting to come out of the little drainage holes probably probably means it's time for a repot because those roots are just searching and trying to find a way to get out of the container that it's in because there's no more space. Um, so the danger, you know, of, of having your plant be root bound is instead of there being soil that the, the water can just soak into and can easily get dispersed to the roots, you just have a thick layer of roots in there and water is just continually getting poured onto the roots and the water then sits on the roots and that's when the roots can get root rot. And it, one, smells awful. <laughs> Two, <laughs> okay. they get mushy and brown and then have no way of still providing the leaves and the rest of the plant with water because they're damaged and, and basically dead. So, you know, being able to be mindful of that and repotting your plant um, when you're seeing those roots, seeing a good amount of those roots is really important because um, you're going to help the plant continue to grow much more um, and not just kind of start to die off, especially when it's root bound, you'll kind of start to see the leaves will get smaller and smaller as they continue to grow out. They're going to stop pro like producing these really big full leaves. 
they just get smaller and smaller because they're not getting as much nutrients as they should. Okay. So yeah, those are the three right. things I would be checking for. Um, would be, you know, bugs, making sure the plant is not moldy from overwatering, um, checking the leaves, all that fun stuff. And then, you know, looking for underwatering and any sort of diseases that the plant might have on the leaves um, that are that are visible through those leaves. Well, when we get them home, uh, we often like to repot uh, mm -hmm. our, our soil. And mm -hmm. uh, we chameleon people like organics. We we don't necessarily like all those little fertilizer balls, at least yeah. on the surface. Uh, yeah. Fertilizer bulbs are, I guess, okay inside, but we don't want the chameleon to uh, zap a cricket and accidentally get one of those fertilizer yeah. bulbs in, yeah, inside. Totally. That, that's no good. But let's talk about when we go to look for soil, mm -hmm. our, our typical Home Depot, there is mm -hmm. so much soil over there. What should we look for for these house plants? What would be good for them? It is. It's it's a little more difficult when adding, you know, um, a chameleon in there because you don't want it to to be in contact with anything that's bad for it. Um, whereas plants can take on a little bit a little bit more of the the gross stuff, we'll say. Um, so I I personally try to avoid the big name brands if that makes sense because a lot of the times those have so many extra additives in them that that you don't really need um it's kind of just a filler to fluff up the soil for lack of a better term um so i try to use things that don't really well one that don't have manure because the smell is just atrocious so okay. looking for things that don't have the manure in it um because there's other ways to fertilize your plants without without needing that in the soil. Um, you know, looking for, at least for the house plants for me, looking for something that is well draining is important. Um, there's a difference between like a potting mix and a potting soil. Most of the time, the potting mix, from what I've seen, has like, it's chunkier. So it's gonna have more like charcoal and orchid bark and perlite things that help the the soil to actually drain well. Whereas if you get something, I know there are certain brands that carry, um, I forget what they call it, but basically it doesn't let the water soak in, um, which is actually not good. So the soil is kind of like hydrophobic for the best, uh, the best way to explain it, um, which is technically not, but trying to pour water or let that water soak in through the bottom of the pot it's not getting watered. It's almost blocking any any sort of water from getting in. So just being mindful of that, looking for that chunky soil that has like rocks and charcoal and perlite and orchid bark is my best friend, which is I have a big tub of it next to me. It's literally just bark um, that is really helpful with getting it to be well drained. Um, I also use, it's called Fluval Stratum. A lot of people put it in their like fish tanks um and it's these little beads that just help it help the plant from what i've seen grow a lot better i'll mix perlite and flu wall stratum with that um especially when i have a new little plant baby growing just because it I, from what i've seen it helps it a lot if drainage is so important how come these soils that we get they turn into is a, a block if it doesn't <laughs> get enough water it's like is that the totally. peat moss inside and what yeah. is, why did, well, explain what is going on and then why totally. is that included? So a lot of the times, um, I guess the best way to explain this is if the soil's older, like if that, if that plant has been in that pot for a year, could even be last time, all of the nutrients is sucked out of the soil. So there's really not anything else that is, is giving any sort of, you know, help to the plant because it's basically just turned into this little rock hard pile of dirt because it sucked out all the things that's helping the plant and then just comes together and gets sucked up and, and turns into a rock, like you said. So that's why it's important to be, you know, to be checking the soil, make sure it's not that rock hard thing because then your plant isn't really getting any nutrients. There's only so many times you can pop some some fertilizer into that and the plant's still doing well, you kind of need to revive it with that new soil. But um, that's the main thing I've seen. If it if it's been a while since it's repo been repotted or that soil is really old, um, 
that's kind of what happened. So, well, let's talk about uh, maintenance of our mm -hmm. plants uh, as far as uh, fertilizer. How yeah. would you fertilize your standard house plant? Normally try not to use the big name brands just because of all the additives and stuff. But um, I have used for, I would say for about a year that there's this miracle grow. Um, it's called liquid plant food. And it's super nice because you just pump it. It's like in a pump bottle. So you just squirt some of it into, um, I can't remember how much water. I think it's like a gallon of water or something. Um, and you use that to water your plants. You normally do that on the bottle. It says like once every two weeks. That can be a little excessive. I do about once a month and it still works great. But this company actually just sent me um, this stuff that I have been using now. And I have seen a difference. And it's called, I won't say it, but it's basically fish poop, oh. which sounds really oh. gross. Oh, I see. But, yeah, sorry. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's it's literally organic soil conditioner. Um, and so you just pour it in. It's basically like concentrated fish poop, but it's super mm -hmm. helpful for the plants. It's a natural thing that you, you're not putting all these chemicals in. This is literally from nature. Um, so I would look for any sort of um, anything that is like fish related is great when it comes to, you know, conditioning and fertilizing your soil. Um, there's so many different options for it. Um, even if you were to just Google it, you'll get plenty of things that pop up because people have seen how important it is to, you know, try to avoid using the, the more chemically based fertilizers and stuff. Cause it's like, if you're not going to put that into, into some, into other things that are, living why are you putting it into a living plant i'm gonna do we're gonna do a round of uh general troubleshooting and so okay th this and this is going to be very general high level because we're going to be talking about all the house plants that we could figure out to put into these cages and so totally uh very high level uh we'll get to species specific later let's okay. say we have we found whether it's a chiflera pothos mm -hmm. spider plant we mm -hmm. have all these in the cages what kind of things would we look for to determine whether if the plant is underwatered? Same thing as I would say, you know, looking for them at Home Depot. Um, the good thing is, like I said, they're in a cage that's getting a bunch of humidity. So hopefully you guys won't have to deal with this as much. Um, but the main thing to look at when it's underwatered is one, check your soil, like you were saying, if it's starting to get kind of like rock hard and there's just not a lot of moisture in there that that is a common sign it's underwatered um a side note on that i do recommend using a moisture meter which i thought i had next to me oh yeah i do um moisture meters are great when it comes to the soil i think i got this on amazon uh -huh. like six bucks but you just stick it in the soil it tells you what you know what level your soil is at um and i would say anywhere between like a seven to a nine is good. Um, so checking it with that is always super helpful. Most of the time, if people are asking questions, I'm like, do you, did you check your, check your moisture meter? And that caught it, it probably solves 80% of the cases, to be honest with you. Okay. Cause even though the soil looks really wet or looks really dry, it could be, you just can't tell. Um, so okay. that would be something checking the soil, uh, making sure the leaves, like I was saying, aren't browning or turning yellow on the tips. Most of the time they're going to brown first if they're, if it's too dry and not getting enough water. Um, so checking those and then, you know, just checking to see if the leaves are starting to not be perked up, kind of like this guy, if the leaves aren't perking up like this and they're just starting to like all droop down, that's another another common sign. It just looks like it needs some help. <laughs> it's it's That's the nice thing about okay underwatering you can kind of tell like oh you, you're thirsty now the other side overwatering. what what, mm -hmm. what would we expect to see if the plant is overwatered? this is where it can get a little tricky because signs of overwatering and underwatering can kind of look the same um except like what i was saying before look at the leaves and see where it's yellowing from if it's yellowing from that middle part of the leaf like here again, that's starting, this is a different plant. So it's not actually yellowing. It's just how it looks. But if it's starting to yellow okay. from here and, you know, the stem down, that is most likely going to mean that it's overwatered. Also the texture of the leaf. 
if the leaf is really flimsy and kind of like almost mushy and floppy, that means it's just getting way too much water. There's nowhere for it to put it. It's probably sitting just sitting in a pile of water. So that's a good way to to tell with that too. And sometimes you can get diseases from it being overwatered and looking out for those browning spots again is definitely important if you have lots of um they almost look like something got splashed or spilled on the plant because it'll be like a darkish brown in the middle and there's kind of like a lighter brown ring on the outside um that's mm -hmm. definitely a sign okay. of overwatering as well and now light too much light what what would we expect to see if we were getting too much light too much light your plant is basically going to get sunburned is the best way to explain that your leaves are going to start to turn brown and crispy kind of like what they would what would be happening if it was getting underwatered um just because it's sucking up all of the all of the moisture all of the coloring everything out of the plant if it's getting too much light basically just going to burn right through it so if it's starting to get um really really brown looking <clears throat> looking burnt then you know that's that that's definitely meaning it's getting too much sunlight yeah if it's getting too much light it's definitely starting to turn like a, a darker brown sometimes it'll even turn black if it's really burnt so just being mindful of that not not letting it touch something too that's like really hot um like if, if it's if a leaf is touching one of those those bulbs in there it might be too hot for it mm -hmm. the leaf could burn and then what would we expect if the plant is not getting enough light so if it's not getting enough light um it's going to depending on the plant like if you were to have something that has like two tones in it like i keep using this but it's a great example if you were to have something that has like multiple tones in this, this is a Brazil philodendron, by the way. Um, if it's not getting enough light, you're going to start to see the the leaves that come out are just going to kind of be one color. They're not going to have the different variegation because it's not getting enough light to let those new leaves come out and produce all the different fun colors. Um, it's just kind of doing its best to put out a leaf. So it's just going to be like, OK, here's like a here's a green leaf mm -hmm. for you. Um, so you're going to start to see that. Um, like I was saying too, you will start to see the leaves are going to be smaller. You're not going to have as large of leaves as you would if the plant was getting enough light. They're going to kind of be really tiny. And just like I said, the, the plant is just trying to pr still produce leaves. So it doesn't really, there's not really a way for it to focus on giving you those good solid big leaves. It's just like, here you go. Here's a leaf. I did my best. Okay. So small leaves and, uh -huh. and solid coloring. Okay, so let's go back to that uh, question about pesticides. Uh, a little mm -hmm. while ago, we in the chameleon community, uh, we're, we pay attention to pesticides because, of course, we're worried about what our chameleon is going to ingest. Uh, they will be totally. licking the leaf, and so contact uh, contact uh, pesticide is a concern for us. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a, a couple of chameleon species that will actually chew on leaves, so even the systemics are something mm -hmm. that we pay attention to. Mm -hmm. And uh, back when we had neonicotinoids, uh, mm -hmm. that was that was actually okay because we had so many chameleons eating leaves that had neonicotinoids in it. We essentially determined that, okay, it is, it is safe. I mean, they said mm -hmm. it's not going to pass the blood uh, brain barrier mm -hmm. for vertebrates, and it looked like that was the case. Well, they went ahead and they banned neonicotinoids. And so now we're starting at ground zero. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Do you have, what do you know about how greenhouses today use uh, pesticides? And, and I know there's so many different greenhouses, so this is going to be just a yeah. general answer. Totally. Yeah. So I don't know specific scientific names of different, um, you know, pesticide preventing measures that they use um but you know i i have seen them use things where they'll walk through the whole greenhouse <clears throat> spray things down um with every plant you know or like you had kind of i think touched on there's like sometimes they just have a system that'll spray um, through their greenhouse. Yeah, I don't know a whole lot about specific names, like I had said, but I guess what I would, would tell, you know, 
you chameleon lovers is just be mindful that like just kind of go into the mindset of thinking okay these are probably going to have some sort of pesticide on them not a whole lot of research has been done to you know find out what is what is going to be okay for my specific pet my specific reptile my specific chameleon and just go in knowing you're probably going to want to wipe off the leaves spray them down like I had kind of said before just as a preventative because like I said you never know um I even do that I don't have reptiles I would love to I think a chameleon would be awesome I have cats so I'm mindful I have cats and a dog I'm super mindful of wiping down those leaves because you just never know, you know, you want to, you want to play it yeah. safe. So making sure you see it, looking for that white residue, wiping it off. All right. Uh, do you have anything else you'd want to share with uh, the, the uh, people attempting to keep plants in their <laughs> chameleon cages? Yeah, totally. I think uh, just a word of encouragement that, you know, if you can keep a chameleon thriving, you can keep a plant thriving. It's, it's not as difficult as people think it is. Um, just really being mindful of those three things I said, um, just, you know, looking out for the different light, the different watering and any sort of diseases or bugs are things that people don't always think to look for. But if you're looking for those three things and, and you know, checking on your plants every once in a while, you're going to you're going to be a good plant parent. You're going to be able to know those different signs and and tell what it needs um, and and it's, I promise you, it's not as, not as difficult as, as the world may make it seem. <laughs> Elizabeth, if somebody wanted to uh, see all of the very interesting plants that you have uh, to offer, where would they find you? Sure. So I, um, right now my Etsy is under, under construction as I need to add a bunch of stuff in there. But a lot of the times I have stuff on Etsy, um, if you have an Instagram, that's the best way to get in contact with me and for me to be able to send you my availability. Um, I'm working on a website. It's just my, you know, a lot of the times I, I get specific plants for specific people and what they've asked. So I don't always have everything up there and posted. But if you were to look through my Instagram page, look through my Etsy, you'll see what I normally commonly have. I do have a lot of like the more rare plants as well like lots of different fun albos or um, like syngonium some different um like philodendrons so you know those are those aren't gonna I'm not gonna put like 10 of those up on the page so if you were to look through my Instagram that's the best way to see what I have you can always message me and say hey like what's your availability I'll send you my availability list you can you can always send me a picture of a plant and you're like I have no clue what this is but I want it I can probably find it for you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of the best way right now. Hopefully in the future, I'll have a, have a, I guess a better updated way of showing people what I have besides just sending my availability list. That's just product goes, goes very quickly, which is amazing, but it's hard to, you know, keep those Etsy's and uh, Etsy and all that stuff up to date when, um, when product. Say somebody is putting together a chameleon cage and they need that hero plant, mm -hmm. that one plant that's going to provide the cover and everything while the, everything else grows in. How would they contact you for something like that? I have, um, I think I have up on my page. It could be wrong. You're going to want to either contact me through Instagram, through Facebook, through Etsy, or my email, which is propagatedperfection at gmail.com. Um, so as long as you remember the name, just put at gmail.com after and, and I'm there. Um, so those are those are definitely the best ways to get in contact with me. OK, they contact you. They say, hey, I'm part of the chameleon community. So, you know what they're looking for. And I'm just looking for a big plant and you can tell them what's available at the time. Yep, definitely. Definitely can. And, you know, if I don't um, have whatever it is at that time, I'd say give me a week or two. I'll be able to to get it. And, and I'm honest with you guys. If I can't get the plant, I let you know. I don't let you go down this whole spiral of, oh, I'll get it in a month. Don't worry if I'm not going to have it. I'm not going to have it. And I'll let you know. And I'll try to work with okay. you and find something else that will that'll work instead. So instead of like a pothos, maybe we'll do a philodendron. So, yeah. But All I'll right. be able to get it. <laughs> in that case, uh, everybody, uh, this is your, uh, your contact. If you want to get that hero plant for that chameleon cage <laughs> quickly and don't want to wait a year to uh, grow it yeah. out yourself. <laughs> 
And Elizabeth, I want to thank you so much for coming on okay. and sharing your experience with us. Of course. I appreciate you having me. And I hope this is really helpful to everyone. Everyone, say goodbye to Elizabeth. Bye, Elizabeth. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> we'll see you later. Well, folks, that is our show for the night. Thank you very much for joining me, Elizabeth, and Blue uh, here today. The Chameleon Academy has many forms of outreach if you want to be involved with chameleons throughout the week. We have a podcast, an Instagram account, and a website that has all of this information. And if you would like to support this outreach, I do have a Chameleon Academy Patreon. Uh, very much appreciate all of my Patreon supporters who are supporting me at this time. If you would like to join, uh, please find the Chameleon Academy Patreon. It will be linked below, uh, and I definitely appreciate any support. I hope you enjoyed your Chameleon Hour. Please come back and join us. This uh, Chameleon Hour happens every other week. And when it comes to all these things about Chameleon herpetoculture, I encourage you to learn, understand, and pass it on. See you next time.